Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. James Lyons-Weiler coming to you as usual live from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the show Unbreaking Science, and we are um, hoping to have an interview today with a UK informed citizen. We'll see if he makes it, uh, but not a problem uh, if he doesn't. We have so many things to talk about. Um, not the least of which is uh, IPAC EDU. Um, we have a biology course is live, ready for uh, enrollment courses start next week on Wednesday the 16th. Uh, we have a course in analytics, which I'm going to show you a little bit about today. Um, those courses start the next day after that in the afternoon. So, um, but first I wanted to do a favor for a fine upstanding American, uh, Luke Yamaguchi has this cool course I wanted to share with you. He sent me the link and a link to share with you. Uh, it's a cool course on the micro, gut microbiome. So let's take a look at that. Early microbiome development is critically important and may affect health outcomes later in life. For example, this is a study that was published in the journal Pediatric Research titled, A Possible Link Between Early Probiotic Intervention and the Risk of Neuropsychiatric Disorders Later in Childhood a randomized trial. The researchers in this experiment took 75 infants and randomly assigned half of them to receive a probiotic bacteria called Lactobacillus rhamnosus for the first six months of their life. The other half of the infants received a placebo, which is an inert substance, instead of the probiotic. The researchers then followed these infants for 13 years and found that 17% of the children in the placebo group went on to develop ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or Asperger's syndrome. Interestingly, all of the children who were diagnosed with ADHD or Asperger's syndrome were male. But here's the kicker. None of the children who received the probiotic as infants during the first six months of their life went on to develop ADHD or Asperger's syndrome. The researchers conclude by saying, probiotic supplementation early in life may reduce the risk of neuropsychiatric disorder development later in childhood. We are beginning to see just how important the infant microbiome may be in affecting health even into adulthood. So now the question is, how do we build a healthy microbiome from the get-go? All right, cool. So there's the, uh, the place to register for his uh, course. Uh, it's $47 as I understand it um, at tinyurl.com microbiomejlw. Um, he offered, um, you know, some compensation for this, and I declined. I just, I just love Luke, and I just want him to get his. You should take a course with this man. He knows his stuff. He's very uh, intelligent, really, you know, a, a brainy, brainy guy, super brain. So, um, again, Dr. James Lyons Weiler here. I want to um, so next, I want to celebrate a few things, and um, you know, let, let let people know that we're getting there. We're getting somewhere. Uh, my blog, jamesliancewiler.com, has reached 1.2 million views. 1.2 million views at jamesliancewiler.com. I have um, many, many thousands of followers, um, which I, you know, very wish I didn't have to have followers. I wish that life was, you know, good and soft and peaceful for everyone. Um, but um, what apparently the word that I'm getting out in terms of the way that science is conducted the way that science should be conducted. Um, and um, apparently I'm a useful resource to humanity at this stage of my life, and I'm grateful for that, to help clarify what's going on, as Luke does. There's many people that can do this. Um, so I, I wanted to um, alert people that I've been censored on LinkedIn. I suspect it's due to this article. This article is one that I published in um, uh, April. 2020. The title is, is CDC Barring Pneumonia Deaths from Flu for COVID-19. On the, social, uh, the, the professional um, social media site LinkedIn, um, that particular site, I had something like 16,000, I can't remember, maybe I'm exaggerating, it might be 12,000 followers, but I lay out um, on a cue provided to me by Ali Fujito in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that in 2014, between 2014-2015, the CDC actually changed the way that they tracked uh, and reported 
uh, influenza deaths. And in 2014, they separated out influenza pneumonia and influenza um, and pneumonia uh, numbers. And so these, these two columns here add up to 55,000 influenza plus pneumonia, but you have mo the bulk of them are just pneumonia. And, and that means they're combining they, uh, in, in future years, in 2015, 2016, you can see that they just do influenza and pneumonia. Uh, I actually had to calculate this cell right here. They didn't report that. They s reported them separately, and I calculated 55,000. It's about 11 to 1 in terms of other sources of pneumonia for influenza. Um, and so if you actually estimate, use that 11 to 1 ratio, you estimate the percentages of deaths um, due to influenza, it's, it doesn't even reach, for 2014 to th 2016, it didn't reach above 5,000. Those are verified pneumonia deaths. Well, in the age of coronavirus, this becomes very important. If you go season by season by season, the number that are actually reported, you know, the lowest number is 12,000, the highest number is 51,000, 61,000, sorry. Uh, the number that are expected to have been due to pneumonia are provided in this column, the number that uh, this column, and that the number that in, in the third column, fourth column, sorry, and the third column, the number of deaths that are expected to be due to influenza, verified influenza, are, are in this column. Those are expectations. It's just a calculation. But you know, the the message here is that the CDC has been using fear to promote influenza vaccination by overestimating the deaths from the flu. Um, and in fact, between the FDA and the CDC, they, they use these terms interchangeably. They, they, they used to call it deaths from influenza. That means influenza infection with or without pneumonia, they, it, which is, you know, expected to be with pneumonia. But and then, and then they, they move it to, OK, now we have something called flu disease or flu syndrome. They'll change the terminology from time to time. And flu disease and flu syndrome are, get this, all the deaths due to pneumonia or due to viral infections in the lung that include influenza, uh, RSV, SV, synecdochal uh, uh, virus, and, and cor coronavirus. Way back in 2015, they lumped together coronavirus deaths. Now, it may be a different strain of coronavirus back then, and if you separate it out, you, you look at the, the relative risks of those three other viruses, it looks like there's a lot of coronavirus deaths maybe back then compared to flu. You know, uh, But they put it all together and they say 55,000, 81,000 a year, wherever they pull the numbers out of, um, and those numbers then put it above 6 to 7% of all causes of death for influenza, but it's not influenza infection for, with the virus. It's just influenza or, um, I'm sorry, flu syndrome or influenza. And this was bothering Allie for a while. She sent it to me, um, I think it was, would have been in May, Mar March. Yeah, sorry, uh, March. She would have sent it in March, and then I wrote it up. I was like, yeah, I'll take this on. But it was bothering her last year, too, or she brought this up a couple of times. And so... Um, I bring, I bring forward the data as presented by various regulatory agencies that are promoting influenza burden, estimated influenza burden. These numbers are way, 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 way amplified, way amplified, 11 to 1 amplified, uh, perhaps. And so this the, the point is um, they use these numbers to justify the national influenza campaign. Okay, they, they, they use them to exaggerate them, uh, the number of deaths here. And uh, forget the percentage rates here. We're not doing commercials for them. But, uh, you know, the number of illnesses here are, it says influenza disease. Influenza disease to them includes uh, all these four deaths from all these four viruses and any other thing that can cause undiagnosed, uh, you know, pathogens, uh, uh, undiagnosed um, respiratory illnesses. So what does that mean for coronavirus today? I mean, they're, exagger they're exaggerating the numbers. For, that's their MO. They borrow from one type of disease to elevate the numbers from another. This is 2014. Uh, since 2014, and, and, and now it's 2020, and we have coronavirus all of a sudden. Oh, my God, look at all these deaths due to coronavirus. Something's really strange here. And I started out this little segment by saying LinkedIn actually 
shut me shut me down. I had 16,000 professional followers. So I'm asking everybody to go to jameslinesweiler.com, get the first article that you see there, which will be this article, uh, censored, is CDC barring pneumonia deaths from flu from coronavirus, and get it out there. This, this is, you know, a very, very, very important article that needs to be read, needs to be understood by the public. Um, regardless of where you stand on vaccination, if the justification for the, the entire influenza program it has been based on a pack of lies, then we have a problem. The public should have a problem with that because we're doing it for 4,500 4, 4, or 5,000 deaths the, in, in medical uh, lingo that's called the number needed to treat. We have to vaccinate, you know, 370 million or 180 million, whatever the number is, to, to, to you know, to, to try to prevent through herd immunity this. And I'm not saying we should shut down the national flu campaign. I'm saying people should be given a choice, especially when the risk is amplified. The risk is numerically amplified for influenza. And we're also seeing, of course, that Deborah Burks announced way, way back in April that the MO of tracking uh, coronavirus was that if you had the, 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 the virus and you tested positive for it and you died, you were determined to die with even die from even if you only died with so there's a whole lot of activity behind the scenes that i i know of and i'm involved in and in trying to right those wrongs and and get the word out the last thing i need is to linkedin to shut me down so i brought it over to my own blog jameslineswiler.com um and jameslineswiler.com is going to become kind of a place to go uh, we, we're starting to see some submissions of articles we expect expect some new submission of articles um from some really eloquent writers uh, to get their stuff amplified here. And I have a personal commitment from that company to not, from, from the WordPress company, to not censor my material there. A face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with them. So um, that being said, uh, I think we're getting under, the, under their skin a little bit. And, you know, Highwire's doing a fantastic job. Uh, Children's Health Defense is doing a fantastic job. You're doing a fantastic job. Staying on point, staying on target. Um, so, you know, and we have so many initiatives. Let me just slow down for a little minute here and tell you some of the things that I wanted to let you guys know about. Um, we have stunning publications coming out in science, public health policy, and the law. These are peer-reviewed publications. They're stunning, but they're objectively peer-reviewed. And I'm telling you, you, you ask one of the authors of one of these papers that's published, um, I, I put them through the ringer, me, me and the reviewers who've got great reviewers that, that really take a good close look at the, not just the, you know, acceptability, the grammar, the spelling, that's nothing. But, but uh, the papers that we publish in science, pu pu science, public health policy and law have to pass muster in terms of did they stand on, on their, on their, on their, on their own? Uh, do, are they internally consistent with their logic? Do, do they provide evidence of their positions and conclusions? And, and it's a grueling process. I, I have one paper in review that's going to come out, hopefully, if they pass the uh, the muster, um, that is just going to blow your socks off. Um, there's three there's three that are coming actually that'll blow your socks off. But but that's the outlay. That's that's what I do as a scientist. I I, 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 I bring forward perspective on science, public health policy, and the law as an academic, and I'm bringing this to the public. And so in the public forum, in the public square, so to speak, these are articles that you're going to want to know, not just read. You're going to want to print them out and you want to bring them to your legislators. That's really important that you use these and leverage them because that's what they're for. Um, we have uh, uh, just accepted a, a stunning critique of the Cochrane um, safety review on, on the MMR vaccine. That's huge. You, when you see that and you see what the authors have done, um, it's incredible. Um, I can't really tell you about the other one that's just been accepted because that I'm not in control of the timing of the release of that. The authors have asked to embargo it strategically, so um, I'm giving them an abeyance on on the on pulling the pulling the um, the strings on that. But um, I do want to make an announcement that Chris Shaw and I are going to do a Zoom 
uh, conversation on aluminum and vaccines. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about the evidence that I know of. He'll be talking about the evidence that he knows of. And I, APEC has actually invited a research grant proposal from Dr. Shaw at the University of British Columbia to be funded by the public to conduct a critical study in aluminum that's never been done. It's an animal study. If you don't like animal research, you know, um, you probably don't want to attend uh, to, to hear what we're going to be doing to, to, to mice, but, or if we're funded. Um, and uh, the, the way to sign up for the conference call is to, to, to find out how you can help with this is to send an email to info at ipaknowledge.org send an email to info at ipaknowledge.org uh, with the subject line community aluminum um, study. So we're going to put this up here right now. Um, send email to email to info at ipaknowledge.org and um, subject line community aluminum study. This is really important, guys. Um, it'd be really super, super critical to get as many people on this conference call as possible. Uh, I have to edit this and bring it down. Look at how we do these things live. I have no shame. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. So email to <laughs> info at ipaknowledge.org. Subjects like community aluminum will get you an invitation to um, to that very, very important conference call. Why did I call it the Community Aluminum Study? It's the communal, Community Aluminum Study because it's your dollars and your effort in community fundraising that will make the science possible. And um, the, the proposal's in-house. It has gone out for peer review. It, it's a very, very strong proposal, research proposal. It's not an insignificant amount of funds. And that we need all hands on deck. We need everybody who cares about the uh, amount of aluminum in the CDC schedule, ASIP approved, recommended, whatever, um, to get on board with us. And you're going to be key because you're one of the first people to hear about it to get on board and get other people on board with this. Extremely, extremely important. So uh, please, please do um, come aboard. Uh, the, the, one of the last things that I want to talk about in terms of like things that are going on is this IPAC EDU. Um, I mentioned it earlier. We have courses in biology, biology A. It's basically the same thing as the first semester of, of AP Bio. Um, it, it's the equivalent of the first year college course, absolutely. Um, I used to teach such a course, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, and I love teaching. Anybody that knows me could just figure out, just look at my mannerisms, how much I like to share information. I, I, I tr would like to think that I've put a lot of love and care into putting the courses together. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I want to show you guys uh, as an example. Just I'm not going to give the whole presentation, but I'm going to go through the slides that I put together on spreadsheets here uh, for IPAC EDU because this... Uh, um, this will give you a feel for you know the the how how detailed uh, an education you're you're going to get if you sign up for analytics. Um, yeah, those, those slides are loading now, so uh, it's going to be a while. There's like a hundred slides for the first lecture. Don't be daunted though; it's a good thing. It's just just means that go stepwise. So let's see if that loaded up okay. Where are we here? Uh, yeah, they are right here. All right, so check it out. Um, 104 slides, analytic spreadsheets. This is just the first lecture. What you're going to learn, let me go back there. I'm going to restart. I went too fast. Um, what you're going to learn um, in the course is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. How to input or export data, how to arrange your spreadsheet, how to execute basic mathematical operations on data, how to execute formulas, how to turn your data into graphs, a correlation plot, histogram, a pie chart, how to perform repeated mathematical operations, how to calculate a linear correlation between two variables, and how to test a simple statistical hypothesis. 
Okay, so my purpose and, and intention of, of teaching this course is to empower the public to be able to put their hands on data in a, in a meaningful way, in a, in a manner in which they know that what they're doing is robust. Uh, you can use this course to learn how to manage your household budget in a spreadsheet, excuse me, how to manage your organization's finances, whatever. But um, really the, the motivation is you know, to break it down day by day, stepwise. These are the things in the first day, um, even to, to the basics of like opening your spreadsheet. In this case, we're using Excel. Uh, there are other spreadsheets, but you know, it's just step by step, how to open it up. You put, open it up, you, what, what the landscape looks like, which are the rows, which are the columns very detailed step by step you you will not um miss a step here and if you do miss a step as we go through it and how to do all these things on the computer we'll just repeat the instructions again um and of course you'll have the video all the people that enter the course for the video uh for, will have access to the video throughout how to put data into how to type it in how to move around all this stuff and this is just the first um, course, how to zoom, adding the columns, very simple, how to use functions to do this, right? Now, this not might look like it's really exciting, but once you master this stuff, and mastery comes from doing, you know, 15 projects over the course of the semester, basically doing the same thing that we're going to build on in, in future, future uh, classes, things like, you know, uh, once you learn something, how to do compound operations, there's three ways to calculate the, the mean of columns and you know how the importance of getting your math right and how to sort your data and things like that. But there's a slide here I want to get to that really struck me as the motivation. This is relevance to current events. Every lecture at IPAC EDU is going to close with a section on relative relevance to current events. And there's a study that was done in the UK, and it was a published report in the UK that um, looked at the number of teenagers in developed countries that had low numeracy, the, all right, the percentage. And they, they're focused on the UK here. This is literacy, and this is numeracy. I look where the United States is. We're like third from the bottom in literacy, and we're dead last on numeracy in terms of the percentage of teenagers there are almost 40 percent of our teens qualify as uh, uh, in, innumerate and there's illiteracy and there's innumeracy so the point is going through this course you get a refresher on some very basic elementary ele very elementary operations in mathematics but it's also a prerequisite for other courses in analytics that we're going to be offering in the future like spreadsheets too. So this is just analytics one. Here's the whole syllabus online here. You can go there. But um, in the full, full course listings, there's a whole series of courses on analytics. Spreadsheets two uh, will go into um, more of the hypothesis testing, more of the how do you do an analysis, how do you calculate a t-test. We'll review that, I think, a bit in the first semester. But the second semester, how do we get into doing things like t-tests? How do we do odds ratios, uh, pro tests of proportions? And the statistical tests that are used in observational studies. So if, if you want to be able to take and really understand and, and develop a, a true understanding of what it means to analyze some you know data, get a chi-square test done and things like that. Um, and then in the third semester in analytics, there's going to be logic, formal logic and reasoning. We're going to teach the public how to conduct formal logic and reasoning, literally, if A, then B, and so on, things like that. Uh, the reason being that um, once you learn this, and you learn it well in a very formal way, you can tease apart other people's arguments and find the flaws in their logic. And I want to empower the public that way. In analytics, in, the, in, if, in, in another semester, another course, I want to hire somebody to teach the advanced students. And it just might, there might be just a handful that make it through all of these, but the, the, the truly advanced students, um, how to do some macro development in Excel and how to use uh, uh, visual basics. So that would be a, a very advanced course. But you know the same for all the other tracks. In biology, you have to take bio A to take bio B. Once you take bio B, then you can get into things like the environmental uh, 
uh, biology. The uh, biology of nutrition, well, Ashley Everly is going to be teaching the uh, environmental um, biology. Michael Gaeta and I are putting a syllabus together on the biology of nutrition. Um, and uh, genetics, I'll be teaching genetics. I used to love to teach genetics, both as a graduate student and as a professor, um, assistant professor, I should say. But um, evolutionary biology, that's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm thinking of having two courses in organismal biology to get people off of their screen and outside studying animals and plants. Two courses. Why two courses? Because if you do one in your sophomore year, your second year of, of this, working towards your full certificate, then you can do another one as a senior thesis um, in your fourth year thesis for your, cert for your certificate for the fourth year. Um, and you can compare, you can go back and grade your, your, your or, uh, organism, um, biology of organism report. So you pick a, pick a species. It's going to be a lot of fun. The whole thing's going to be a lot of fun. I'm getting a lot of queries from people who teach courses like this, that they want to add courses to IPAC EDU to empower. Now the, the courses are like 160 bucks each for 15 lectures. That's totally, totally doable on a lot of people's budget. If you can't make it, uh, we don't have financial aid yet, but I've put out a query for donations, you know, um, sorry, gifts. It, we're, we're an LLC for, for gifts um, to IPAC EDU um, so, so that we can get some people on board who can't afford it. But you, we also have a payment plan of um, $40, um, $40 a month for four months. So you know, these courses, they're designed to empower the public through knowledge. We're going to get the fundamentals right. And it, it's going to be very important, I think, uh, to be, in our ability to stand firmly in, in, in the public square and know our stuff. And, and that's 100% of why I'm doing this. Uh, I'm doing it to empower the public so that we can have more engaging um, discussions um, with the people who are uh, public servants in public health and with your doctor and with the school administrators and things like that. So um, it is really, you know, um, I, I'm hopeful that we, well, we have like 25 or six students in the biology class and we have six or seven in the analytics class, which is great. Um, I want 15. So if you're sitting on the fence about, you know, which course to do, the bio, both courses will be available in the future, run again just by getting the video. You won't have the, the live time with me, but, um, you know, please, you know, sign up. Dr. Shannon Croner is going to be developing a whole certificate uh, lineup for biology with, or, sorry, with psychology, with Psych 1 and Psych 2. She's got this really cool course she wants to develop called the Psychology of Decision Making. I'm really stoked. I mean, really, really excited to be doing this and, and bring, bring this stuff forward. And if you have an idea for a course that's like a legitimate topic that you think I would that I would take teaching or have taught, um, feel free to propose it to me. Um, we can't guarantee that every course that is proposed will be taken on, but we're very interested. The the the, the track in, on law is an interesting one. the The law track uh, will lead to a certificate in law courses from IPEC EDU. And the first course that we're developing, Kevin Barry and I are developing a course called uh, History of Law, uh, Western Law, and in, uh, the History of Law in the West in the United States. And uh, that's going to be a fascinating course to work on with him. And then um, there's going to be a course on environmental law, and then another course on vaccine law, and a course on constitutional law. So this way the public can become much better educated, much, much better educated on the foundations upon which this nation uh, was built, where these legal ideas come from. Uh, the history of law in the West and the United States is going to be a prerequisite for the other courses. So we're really, really deadly serious about educating the public down to your bones. We want to educate you. Um, so please consider, the, the, the law courses aren't up yet. That, that might start in, in January. Um, psychology courses might start in January or next fall, uh, but I, I went ahead and pulled the trigger on two courses for you, the analytics and the biology. So um, that's enough about that. Um, the, the current events that I'm currently, you know, concerned about, you're concerned about, those those are very important too. The, the censorship issue, 
um, you know, uh, so much going on. It looks like my guest is a no-show, and I'm not sure why. Let's see what uh, Shannon has to say about it. By the way, if you have an idea for a guest on Unbreaking Science, you can um, email executive producer at unbreakingscience.com and tell Shannon that you have an idea for a guest, and she'll look into it, and, and I'll look into it. Um, that's executive producer at unbreakingscience.com of somebody that you think that I should interview and the suggested topic. Uh, so, you know, I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan. The, 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 this room is set up as like a dojo, but with coronavirus, you know, I don't really like bring a lot of people in, not because I'm trying to avoid that, but just because I don't want to, I don't want to put somebody through the hassle of having to travel and then being told at the last minute they have to quarantine to get back out of the state or to get back into their own state or whatever. Um, uh, I saw his new set. A lot of people are, I watched his, uh, his interview with Ron White and a lot of people are very critical of his new set. It looks like a spaceship. Uh, they're inside a capsule, which I don't know. Maybe there's a psychological reason why he felt like he needed to be encapsulated and just closed away. Maybe he's afraid of coronavirus or something, but, uh, I, I do watch him from time to time because uh, although he, um, he doesn't quite seem to, to to be willing to go there on certain topics with our community. Um, he interviewed Peter Hotez. That was a disaster for Dr. Hotez. Um, and, but he won't bring any of us on. And I'm not exactly sure why. And now that he's got a multi-million dollar deal, you know, whatever he's got for his deal to be on Spotify, uh, I, I don't think he'll be enamored with that now ron white who i think is one of the funniest comedians around um just so self-deprecating so he shows up on the stage with a glass of whiskey in his hand he says look look world i'm a mess and that's it this is what you get um you know he he was talking about getting angry at people when he he, he said he talked about how protective he was of his mother which is understandable. I've been protective of Gracie. She had diabetes. The numbers were inflated. They still, there's this momentum of ignorance, right? That that the 20% risk of death and diabetes. Well, that was not correct, it turned out. That was an exaggerated number. But nevertheless, it scares you. And so you um, want to protect those that you love. And, you know, people do die from coronavirus, no doubt about it. But um, Ron White said that he uh, you know, he's very protective of his, of his mom, and his mom wanted to go out to the grocery store, and there were, you know, she would mask up, and there would be people walking around without masks, and he said how angry he got at people that weren't masking. And, you know, and I just wanted to reach in and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I just wanted to call the set, call the show, and say, wait a minute, you take a look at the science on masking, it's not quite what you think it is. Um, and explain in detail for them what the science on masking actually says about viruses with that particle size and the whole argument of well it's protecting against droplets well even look you know you're making your mask wet by wearing it all day and so on there's issues on both sides of this the effect on co2 but um his anger I could tell he didn't want to be angry. I could tell that he's like, yeah, come on, wear your damn mask so I can bring my mom shopping. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to say, here's the Brownstein protocol. You know, look at all the science on vitamin D. In fact, Joe Rogan, to his credit, said to said to him, "Hey, uh, um, Ron, are you on the vitamin? Are you are you taking your vitamin D?" Ron says, no, he's not taking it. And Joe said he would hook him up with some vitamin D. So hopefully he'll give that to his mom. You know, we, we, we know full well that the people that are at highest risk have vitamin D deficiency. That's a very strong study about that. And Joe actually cited that study. So check out Joe Rogan's new digs. He's moved to um, Texas. Uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. You know why? Because he'll actually think things through. He'll think things through. He, he doesn't do the bumper sticker thing. Um, and and that's uh, the sign of a, a thinking individual. He's, a, he's really a thinking individual. And he may be more awake than he's letting on. He moved from California to Texas. But, uh, you know, I wish him, obviously, the very best. Um, 
he wants to open up a new comedy joint uh, and sell um, um, ribs and uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. And Ron was laughing at him because he was like, yeah, I'm going to open it up at a ranch. And Ron's like, no, 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 no. Location, location, location. You have to, you have to run your uh, comedy club in a town where people can get to it. But Joe's like, no, 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 let him drive your cars out. It'll be great. And Ron's like, no, 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 you're not getting it. You don't want to do that. Um, so <laughs> I, w I would encourage you to check out Joe Rogan. Write to his uh, show if you think that I would be a good guest or Bobby Kennedy would be a good guest or Del Big Tree um, or two of us, two, two out of three. And, you know, try to get him a little bit warmed up to the fact that we appreciate his message and his openness about vitamin D. Um, I, I, that's my advice to you is to warm up to him um, big time. He, he is like a, the, the Oprah for men. It, it's kind of interesting where he's, where he's come from and what he's done. He was doing like a podcast in his basement with his buddies and he's made a, an empire. So um, more power to you, Joe. And uh, I'm not going to belabor anything uh, further today. Uh, p people have things to do, places to go, people to meet. Yeah, or some combination thereof. I, I, I want, you notice I don't talk a lot about politics. But I, 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 the, the closing thought that I will have is, uh, listen, let's talk, I want to talk about fascism in the United States and how it's taken hold of our politics. And people will, will debate, no, go look and re read some more articles, Dr. Jack, on fascism and what it is. Go, you don't know what fascism is because you're saying that it's that it's, uh, you know, corporations running the state. That's not for that's not fascism. Um, the original definition of fascism is is a bundling, and so what a fascist is, it's a bundle of twigs that make things stronger in the in the, in the Italian language. Um, the fascists. So when you bundle things together, it's made stronger. And Mussolini's entire justification of his new form of government was that the state and the um, co corporations were going to work together to make it, uh, Italy strong. And in bundling the power of the state with the power of the corporation, and then I presume the third part of the bundle would be the power of the people uh, and the military, of course. So you bundle it all together into one under one. That was his way of saying, I'm going to be in control of it all. So you have a demagogue who wants to control the military, wants to control the government, wants to control the people, wants to control corporations. That's Mussolini-style fascism. Now, if you look at the, if you go out and find any article that's out there, you'll, you'll find people on the left that are criticizing people on the right and saying that you know, they're fascist. They're calling Trump a fascism. They're, they're academics that are liberal academics saying that fat, we're, the U.S. is inching further and further towards fascism. And... In reality, if you look at um, the, the writers who are on the right that are saying that the liberals are fascist and the thinkers on the right that are saying liberals are fascist, it's really, they, they dance around the definition of fascism. There, there's an article out there that says that nobody can un, agree on what fascism really is and that it changes over time and things like that. But if you go to the core, what I call the spine or the backbone of, of fascism, it's, it's the unholy alliance between corporations and government. That unholy alliance where uh, too much money goes from corporations into campaigns, too much influence goes from corporations into policy, t you know, regulatory capture. Some people stop short of calling it cor uh, fascism. They call it corporatism, where the government's favoring corporatism. I've seen that. Other people just say, you know, that's the way, that that's, a, that's, how, that's, a, that's American politics. Stop being so naive. But I have a hard time picking a political party at all because it seems to me you just have, it's a choice between which flavor of fascism do you want. The Democrats are in bed with pharma. It's the first access that they have to, they're like the nouveau riche. They're very gauche about it. That's why there's so much overreach. They have easy money, the easiest money they've ever, ever raised for politics. That's the, for the last uh, four, six years, I would say, maybe more. Um, the right, historically, legitimate or not, is seen as getting easy money from the military-industrial complex, from big monies, you know, and, and um, companies that pollute, CPTs. That's a new phrase I came up with this week, is CPTs. 
Corporations that pollute. The CPTs on the right are the ones that pump the toxins into the water, into the air, into the environment, and, and that. The CPTs that are on the left are the ones that want to pump the toxins directly into your child's body and deny that they're toxins and control the regulatory agencies that say that the, whether this is a toxin or not. The ATSDR was established. I'm becoming convinced that the ATSDR at the CDC was established 100% for one goal only, which was to do the math that they did with Mitkus and to uh, mislead the public and everyone, and including the Senate, including the Congress, on what a toxic level of aluminum is. So um, the companies that were behind that moved to actually, you know, Julie Gerberding was the director of the ATSDR when they did the aluminum considerations. And they, they've cherry picked Golub, the Golub study. Look at uh, the, the, the vaccinepapers.org, uh, his analysis of the uh, Golub et al. paper, where the, C, the FDA said, or the ATSDR, I'm kind of losing track of the provenance in my brain. It's been a couple of years, but the ATSDR looked at Golub and said, there is one study, and they cited Golub, the Golub study. And they said, listen, they found no toxicity due to the oral doses of aluminum in mice. So that means injected forms of aluminum in infant mice. All right, you know the story. But they actually looked at one study and they chose the value from one study. And according to vaccinepapers.org, and I agree with this assessment, they misrepresented the results of that study. They cherry picked it and they misrepresented and drew a different conclusion than the authors. So that's the foundation of why we think 850 micrograms of aluminum is safe in vaccines and my point is about politics i just really wish it wasn't an election year you know i really wish that every little thing wasn't so politicized and we could come to understand things in a rational way but the back to fascism um american style fascism really took hold with campaign finance reform Campaign finance reform um, is is when you know they, they said we're going to take the take the lid off of corporate donations to corporations, and so I'm very interested not for my vote. My vote's not on the table per se. I'm so apolitical. It's by choice. It's not because I'm not strong enough to decide. It's not because I'm not principled. It's not because I'm undecided. I've decided that I can't vote on left-flavored fascism or right-flavored fascism. If you're a single-issue voter on vaccines, you know your position, you know mine. If you're a single-issue voter on abortions, you know my position. If you know my position, I know yours and vice versa. If you're a single-issue on uh, corporations that pollute um, in the water, in the air, in the earth, in our food, you know, there's a lot of common ground. Um, there is no right answer for me right now except for campaign campaign finance reform. To redo it and, and you know, zero. Maybe a $500 donation from a corporation. That's it. That's it. So um, I would take a look in, into, you know, candidates' positions on distancing themselves. If you're interested in politics and you're trying to make up your mind, distancing the political process and empowering the people. Um, that said, um, I wish you the best of luck in sorting this out for yourself because I don't have any further words of wisdom. This I am a single issue voter on, on American style fascism. And if we could bring this type of fascism to an end by changing the law in our generation, then our children have a chance of having a democratic republic that works the way it's supposed to work. If not, you know, it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. And, it, you know, the doom and gloom kind of narratives that are so easy to do, end of the world, you know, Armageddon. Both sides are predicting Armageddon. It, who, whoever takes the White House, um, whoever wins the election, I would say, it's irresponsible. It's incitement for the left to even talk in public about their fears that Trump might not leave the White House at the same time as it's irresponsible for anybody on the right to say Trump should not leave the White House if he loses. It's incitement for people like Hillary Clinton to specifically say um, that uh, Donald Trump, well, that, 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 that the left, sorry, that Joe Biden should not concede the White House 
to Donald Trump under any circumstances. That's incitement. And it's woefully irresponsible. We're going crazy as a nation. We're losing our mind. We're absolutely losing our mind. We, we need to take a deep breath and figure out what the heck it is that's in our blood, in our bodies, in our brains, and, and change what we're doing to ourselves. And uh, with that, I, you know, we'll have to bring Kevin Corbett on another time. He was supposed to be here, but I hope he's doing well. Knowing him, he's probably at a protest somewhere, yelling into a microphone. He's a good guy, uh, big heart. Um, I can't wait to bring him on and talk about what's in common between the UK and the US in terms of the coronavirus uh, response. Um, I'm going to close out, I guess. I'll put up the link uh, again one last time for those of you that need it. Um, to Luke Yamaguchi's course, and then uh, then we'll close out. If I can find it, here it is. Yeah, there you go, buddy. The the gut microbiome course at tinyurl.com microbiome jlw. Again, he offered some cash for me to do this uh, percentage, but I I said no, just go for it. Um, I'll I'll put it up there, and uh, I encourage you to take the course and and learn a lot and share it with people and uh, we'll see you on the next Unbreaking Science my friends